Psalm 26. Let's read verse 8. Let's read this together. Psalm 26, verse 8. I love, the, I love the house where you live, O Lord, the place where your glory dwells. Friends, I believe that our motivation always in coming to church is because we love the Lord and because we love the place where he dwells. And of course, when David was uh, talking about these things, he was talking about the tabernacle. And then after Solomon had uh, built the temple, then we can refer to this as the temple. And so friends, do you love the presence of the Lord? Where can you find the presence of the Lord? Well, whether we like it or not, at the back of our mind, we always look for the Lord in his temple. We know that the Lord is everywhere. We know that he is everywhere. He is in your house, in your homes. He is in your workplace. But we always look forward to meeting the Lord in the, the temple. And that's what David was talking about here. He said that, I love the place, I love the house where you live, O Lord. And in fact, in chapter 27, from verse 4, this thing was in his heart. He said, one thing I ask of the Lord, verse 4 of uh, chapter 27, one thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek. So he did not just ask, and asking in vain as if doing nothing, but in addition to him asking friends, he was seeking, and what was this? That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord, and to seek him in his uh, temple. So friends, this was the longing of David, he said that, you know, I have one thing. If I have one thing to do, if I have one thing to ask, if I have one thing to seek, he said that, well, that is to seek the dwelling place of the Lord. He said that, that I may seek the house of the Lord, and not only for a day, not only for a Sunday, but he said that all the days of my life, what can you find in the house of the Lord? And then he said that to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. Do you see the Lord here? What was he talking about here? To look intently at the beauty of the Lord. Friends, the beauty of the Lord is in his word, in his promises. The beauty of the Lord is in the things that he is doing in our midst, the signs, the wonders, the miracles that he is doing in our midst. So that he said that, and to seek him in the temple, Verse 5, for in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his tabernacle and set me high above upon a rock. So he was looking even forward for deliverance. He said that when I come before your presence, there is deliverance. And that's the reason why, friends, we are expecting every time that we come before the presence of God. Because we believe that he will deliver that he will save, that he will heal, that he will provide, that he will restore. Friends, so many things. These are the great things that are happening in the house of the Lord. And then he went on further. He said that, Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me, and at his tabernacle will I sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music in the Lord or to the Lord. So friends, do you enjoy our time of praise and worship where we offer to the Lord our songs, our music, when the Lord will minister to us even through those songs so that even while we are singing those songs, friends, there is deliverance happening. But friends, let me emphasize the house of the Lord. What does the house of the Lord signify to us? Well, in Genesis chapter 28, verse 16 and 17, the house of the Lord, as revealed to us by Jacob, 
He said, you know, when Jacob was running away from his brother uh, Esau, and he went to this place, and he spent the night, and he had the dream. He dreamt heaven, where he saw a stair going up to heaven. He saw angels of God coming up and down. And in verse 16, Genesis 28. He said, When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. So friends, as far as Jacob was concerned, friends, the house of the Lord is the gate of heaven. And so he found the beauty of the house of the Lord. But this is the gate of heaven. Is it that this, this, the house of the Lord, the gate of heaven, the reason why we come here, friends, is to prepare us for heaven itself. When we gather, when we are instructed, when we are brief on what's happening in heaven and how can we get to heaven, is that this the gate? The gate is not open yet. It will open soon. When? We don't know. A lot of people are talking about, friends. Go to YouTube. Say September 23, 2017. And they say that that will be the day that the Lord will come, will open the gate. But who knows when? Who knows when? When Jesus himself said that no one knows the hour and the day of his coming. Who knows when? But the thing here is that we have to be at the gate. We have to be preparing ourselves, friends, in the gate. The gate of heaven. And this is the gate of heaven, we are told, friends, when people come together, congregate, encourage one another, pray for one another, strengthen one another, preparing for the opening of that gate. Yes, many times you said, well, I pray on my own. I pray at home, in my workplace, alone. But friends, we are commanded, friends, to come together. Do not for, forsake the assembling of ourselves. Especially as we see the day of the Lord Jesus Christ drawing near. Say that, don't forsake. Don't be like others. They have the practice of forsaking the assembling of the saints. But he said that, no, come together, strengthen one another, and listen. Amen. Remember, friends, the parable of the, uh, of, uh, the uh, ten virgins? There are five of them that were foolish. Five were wise. Who were the foolish ones? They left the gate. They left the gate. When they noticed, friends, that they were running out of oil because they did not have enough oil, well, they had to go somewhere to buy oil. But, friends, when you are in the presence of the Lord, when you are at the gate, just imagine, friends, uh, it's a ball game. Blue Jays. Everybody is lined up. Do you want to get out of your line so that you will be at the last again? Or you will keep your line? See, that's what happened to these five. They left the gate. They went. So when the gate opened, where were they? They were out. And remember, friends, these ten virgins, they called themselves believers. They called themselves believers. And they were at the gate waiting but five of them left. Go, buy. Was it bad, friends, to go and buy? No. That's the right thing to do. If you have the time. But the thing here is we don't know the time. We don't know the hour of his coming. So why leave the gate? So for you not to leave the gate, then equip yourself. Amen. Have enough oil. Be prepared. So that when he comes, then when it opens, then you go in. And so when they left and they came back and they knocked at the door, said, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. What was the response of the Lord Jesus? 
Say, I never knew you. Friends, it's not how we know the Lord that matters, friends, but how the Lord knows us. Amen. See that I never knew you. Well, how many times did Jesus say that? I never knew you. On that day you will call me Lord, Lord, but I never knew you. Who are you? How will the Lord know us? How will the Lord know us? Well, he gave us a clue, friends. He gave us a clue. He said that you shall know them by their fruits. How do we live our lives? How do we live our lives? Are we faithful? Are we faithfully serving him while we are waiting for him? Friends, be reminded of that. Let us be wise. When we are wise, the Lord knows us. When we seek him and he knows that, that uh, we are prepared for his coming, then he knows us because he said that, will I find faith on earth when I come? Will he find faith on us when he comes? If he will find us faithful friends, then definitely we shall go with him. And then the house of the Lord also signifies prayer, a house of prayer. And that's the reason why Jesus in Mark 11, 17, when he went cleansing the temple because the temple was defiled by who? By merchants, by robbers. Mark 11, 17. He said here, and he taught them, and as he taught them, he said, is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. So he was rebuking them, friends, because they were not there to worship the Lord. They did not go into the temple to pray. They were there for business, personal business. They did not care about the Lord. Did they, did, were they concentrating on him? Were they listening to him? No. They were busy doing their things. And he said, that you are robbing the temple of its beauty, of its holiness by what you're doing. This is a house of prayer for all nations. So when we come, friends, before the presence of the Lord in the temple, we come to pray. And the Lord answered prayers. That's why it, when Solomon was dedicating the temple in 1 Kings chapter 8, that was his prayer. He said that, Lord, let your eyes be upon this temple where you chose to bear your name. So that let your eyes, so that men shall come to pray, even foreigners when they come to pray here, that you will bring deliverance unto them. So not only the Jews, friends, but even foreigners that will come, they will be answered in their prayers. So we go to church to pray. That's why I always tell the kids, when they run around, when they're playing around, say, why did you come to church? Did you come to play or did you come to pray? See, we teach our children too. They don't, don't come here to meet friends and they play here and run around. No. That's why I always stop. They say, you go to your teachers. Let's do our part, friends. Instruct them as they are young. We are told, friends, that instruct your kids when they are young and they shall depart when they grow old. But you have to do your part. Look around. Who are they, who are they hanging out with? Who are the people that are around them? Last time we, we said, friends, that you know you will know you will you will know a person by the people that he spent time with. You know who is a fool. A fool will be spending time with his fellow fools. You know who is wise. A wise will spend time with the wise. And so instruct your children. Amen. And the reason why we come is to pray. Remember the parable of uh, the Pharisee and the tax collector? That's in Luke 
chapter 18. The Pharisee and the tax collector. Both of them went to church. Both of them went to the temple. What did they do in the temple? Supposed to be praying. So came the Pharisee because he is used to praying. And he went into the temple and said, Lord, thank you. I'm good. Thank you that I'm not like these people. I'm not a robber. I'm not an adulterer. I'm not a sinner. Thank you, Lord. I bring my tithes. And I fast twice a day. Well, what can you ask? Say, I thank you, Lord, that I'm good. Very good. And then came the other guy, the tax collector, the sinner, the one that was being pointed by this guy, the, the Pharisee said, I'm not like this guy. This guy is a thief. This guy is a robber. So here comes the, the thief, the robber, the tax collector. He could not even look up to God. He could not look up to God. But rather that he, he met his, his presence, Lord, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. I have sinned. I'm not even worthy to stand up here. I'm not even worthy to lift my head and look at you. I am a sinner. He was there, friends, praying, sincerely repenting of his sin. And Jesus, Jesus said, who went home justified? Who went home forgiven of their sins? He said, that, well, you know who. The sinner that came, sincerely praying, said that he was forgiven. But the proud, the Pharisee, friends, that's why he said that, you know, if you exalt yourself, then the Lord will put you down. Because we come to God, friends, not with our pride. Let's approach God with humility. Amen. Every time that you come before God, don't, sometimes we, we thought that God is our servant. Lord, do this. Lord, do that. And if he does not do it, we get offended. Then we leave the church. No blessing. We leave the church. Why? Because he did not answer your prayers. But why should he answer your prayers if you did not even ask in humility? Even my children, friends, if, when they come with their pride, I don't give it. I don't give what they want. But if they come, especially Christabel, would come, Dad, uh, can I have this? With humility. And then immediately, she would say, thank you, Dad. I have not even had the chance, friends, to respond to that request. She already thanked me for it. What will I do? What will I do? I give it to her. She already thanked me for it. She asked with humility, but supposing you would say, Dad, I want this, I want that. What do you think will I do? Get lost. No time for you. If she comes dictating on what she wants, Friends, I won't give. I won't give until they submit, until they humble themselves. They know that. They know that. They cannot come with their pride. No. See, the Lord knows how to deal with us. We are told that we are the children of the living God. If we are his children, then he disciplines us. He disciplines us for our good. So when he deny us of what we are asking, if he withholds the blessing that we are waiting, friends, that can be a, a sign of teaching us, disciplining us, that we may learn to humble ourselves before him. See, we want to be blessed, friends. Who doesn't want to be blessed? We all call on the Lord because we want to be blessed. But make sure that you don't miss the blessing, the attitude of the heart. Amen. So don't be just like this Pharisee that approached the, uh, uh, the Lord with, uh, with pride. The Apostle Paul says that, you know, if you try to lift up yourself or if you try to compare yourself with yourself, you are a fool. How do you compare yourself with yourself? When you compare yourself with others using your own standard, that is comparing yourself with yourself because that is your standard. You are not using the standard of the Lord. What's the standard of the Lord as far as love is concerned? What's the standard of the Lord? When he said that love one another, 
It's the standard that we have. Yeah, I love him. I love her. How do you love your sister? How do you love your brother? Uh, friends, Jesus said that you love your brothers, you love your sister the way that I love you. Sacrificial. Up your standard. Don't use your own standard. See, you, you could have done something that good. Well, you have been acknowledged by men for that. But that's not the standard of the Lord. Without sacrifice, friends, that love is not enough. Because many times, the love that we know would be lust. It's not love. It's not sacrificial. And then, the house of the Lord also signifies a storehouse. A storehouse. Malakai Tritan. Amen. A storehouse. When you come to the house of the Lord, what do you do? We bring your offering. Amen. Just imagine, friends, in Israel those times, so many animals being offered into the temple. And they brought their tithes and their offering into the temple. That is the storehouse of God. Now, do you have your own storehouse? How big is your storehouse? How much can it accommodate? We are told in Malachi 3 that bring your tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house, says the Lord. Test me on this if I will not throw open the windows of heaven and pour out such a blessing that there shall be no room enough to receive it. Friends, no room enough. Do you have enough room for the blessings of the Lord? If there is not enough room, friends, it overflows. It overflows. Right? That's why we are told that give and it shall be given back to you. Good measure, press down, shaken together, running over, shall be put into your bosom, and the measure that you use, it shall be measured back to you. Friends, how big is your measure? A small one? It shall be measured back to you. A small one. How big? But regardless, friends, when it comes back, it runs over. It's overflowing. Because that's the promise of the Lord. Amen. So we bring our tithes to the storehouse of the Lord. Because I know that there is also a storehouse that we have. But what can this storehouse that we have accommodate? And if it's not enough, what do we do? What do we do? Will we let it overflow? Well, again, another parable. The parable of the rich fool. The rich fool. He was rich, but he was a fool man. Not everyone that is rich is wise. Amen. Sometimes you look at a guy, oh, he's a millionaire. A billionaire. A lot of them are fools in the eyes of God. Amen. But they, were, they are adored by men because of their riches. Because sometimes, friends, we look at men and we value them not according to their character. Not according to their character. We value them based on what they possess, what they have. How big is their house? What car is he driving? A doji? The best car in town? Amen. I never changed the brand, friends. Doji from the beginning up to now. Doji. So what kind of a car? Oh, you know, this pastor? Ah. Doji and it's an old model? You value a person by that? Well, friends, we are told in the parable that there is this rich fool. In Luke chapter 12. This guy harvested. And he had enough put it in his barn. Until the barn was full. And said that, no, I built another, another one, bigger one. Friends, no contentment, friends. No contentment. And so he built the bigger one and said, well, now you have enough for yourself. Now you can live. You don't have to work now. You don't have to, you can retire. Sit back, take it easy, eat, drink, and be merry. You have enough. But what did the Lord say? What did the Lord say? Luke chapter 12. Verse 
Verse 30. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? Who will get what you have prepared for yourself? Working so hard, gain so much, and then when you die, who will benefit from it? You? No. Remember that story about uh, someone in Pakistan or somewhere? When he died, that he wanted to bring $67,000 with him. That's part of his will. So when I die, you, you bury with, with me $67,000 US dollars. And so they buried $67,000. Well, that was his will. He was a rich guy. Friends, $67,000 in their place, it's, that's millions. So they buried it. When the, the priest came to know about it, he said, no, 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 no. You cannot buy heaven. You cannot buy heaven. You cannot bring your money. And you know what he was saying to his wife? He said that, you know, let me bring like a, what do you call it? A pocket money, 67000 Just in case Peter won't let me in, I will bribe him. See, I will bribe him. Just in case Peter won't be let in. Friends, sometimes, you know, the gate of heaven is closed. But can I go in? See, you bribe. And the priest said that, no, you cannot. You cannot bribe Peter. You cannot bribe God. So he said, who will benefit from it when you die? So friends, these are truth about the kingdom of God. Let's take this to heart. If we are so consumed about the things of this world, and those things will bring us down. If those things will weigh us down, friends, better give them up. Better seek the Lord. Because he said that, you know, live one day at a time. I will provide. I will provide. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, friends. Some cannot wait. They put things into their own hands. So they do it themselves. But they become fools. Amen. Let's learn to be content. So when we come to the house of the Lord, Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 1, we are told, Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Go near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools who do not know that they do wrong. Don't come to church to offer the sacrifice of fools. Remember that Pharisee? What kind of offering he presented to God? Friends, was it acceptable? No. Let's come with humility and let's guard our steps. Amen. Let's guard our steps. Let's guard our hearts. Come to listen. Come to receive instruction from the Lord. He knows what is ahead of us. And he will prevent. He said that if you do, if you obey me, I will prevent pest. I will prevent the devourer. Say Malachi 3.10. 11. Friends, he said that I will prevent the devourer from devouring your crops. So let's pray that the Lord will strengthen us. Amen. As we come to the presence of the Lord. That's why, you know, regardless of the service that you can offer, offer it to the Lord. Offer it to the Lord. In Psalm 84, see how, how David wanted to offer his life to the Lord. Verse 10. Better is one day in the courts, uh, in your courts, than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. Friends, let us be prepared to serve in whatever ministry that the Lord is calling us to. Don't look for great 
ministries where you believe that you can do it, that you, now you will be on the front line. If I'm not the leader, forget it. I won't serve. No. In the case of David, said that I would rather be a doorkeeper at the house of my God than to dwell somewhere else in the house of the wicked. So be rather, friends, a doorkeeper. You know a doorkeeper? What do you call that in, uh, in a hotel? The bellboy? Doorboy? See who, who gets the tip. Who gets the tip? Well, the bell, bellboy gets the tip. Who gets to be, to be greeted by the guest? The bellboy. Sometimes the manager cannot even approach them. Friends, don't you want that? How about in the, in the course of the Lord? How about in the house of the Lord? When you are the doorkeeper in the house of the Lord, then who will greet you? Who will, who will thank you for that service that you have? Friends, the Lord will not deny you of your blessing. There is a blessing that comes with it. And so I pray, friends, that let's serve the Lord faithfully, wholeheartedly. Amen. Don't pick for any ministry that you want. Pick the least. Amen. Because the least will be the greatest. The greatest will be the least. Amen.